Hello and welcome everyone to the first Food Bites Forum of the year. We are so excited to have you all here to listen to a discussion around one of our four most act on sustainability solutions that was recently outlined in our trend report. It's all about novel packaging. But before we get into the discussion, which we're even more excited about because it's being moderated by Ian Welsh of the Innovation Forum, we wanted to take a moment to share a little bit about Food Bites. For those of you who are new to this space, Food Bites is an innovation connection platform connecting corporates and investors in the food and ag industry with what we believe are the most innovative startups looking to build a more sustainable food future. Now at this point in the year, our program is just about to kick off. So if you're a corporate or an investor who's innovative curious, please reach out to foodbites at robobank.com to learn how we can bring more innovation solutions to your business. And now I want to pass it over to Sonia Sheckers, who's going to talk about startup scouting for 2022. Thanks, Anne, and hello to everyone tuning in. Applications to our 2022 program are now open, and entrepreneurs working to meet the demands of tomorrow's consumer should apply by February 28th at our website. That's foodbitesworld.com. If you have questions about our updated startup program, please reach out to me at sonia.shaker at robobank.com. And corporates and investors who are interested in joining in on discussions around our first quarter theme should reach out to us at foodbites at robobank.com to get involved. With that, I will pass it off to Ian Walsh to kick off today's discussion. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My thanks to Anne and Sonia for their introduction and welcome to the first Food Bites webinar of 2022. I'm Ian Welsh and I will be your moderator for the next hour or so. As Anne mentioned, today we're going to be looking at one of the Food Bites must act on sustainability solutions, novel packaging. We're gonna talk about the significant sector changes from the past few years and how novel packaging fits into greater sustainability goals. There's no doubt that the rise and rise of ready-made prepared foods has driven the need for novel packaging solutions. At the same time, consumers have become increasingly aware of the problems created by plastic pollution and have demanded more sustainable solutions. But as ever, the law of unintended consequences is fully in play. Any alternative product must be able to perform. We don't want to turn a plastic waste problem into a food waste problem. And we need to accept that alongside innovation in material design, there are some circumstances where plastic packaging alongside closed loop recycling may be the best solution. Well, there's certainly a lot to discuss, and I am uh, delighted that, uh, to be, that I'm joined by Jordi Kay, co-founder of Great Wrap, who was our 2021 Food Bites winner, Roseanne Woodham, Packaging Specialist at Grupo Bimbo, and Jinan Lee, Rabo Research Packaging and Logistics Analyst. Now, I'll bring our panel in very shortly, but we do want to involve everyone on the call today, so please do be ready to put your questions and points to the panel. There are two ways to do this. You can put your questions and comments into the chat function and I will put them to the panel. Or if you'd like to make your point yourself, you can raise your hand by clicking on the button in the webinar window and we will bring you into the call so you can speak to the panel directly. If you're happy to, please do turn on video as well as audio for this. You will be, what will happen is you'll be offered the opportunity to turn on your video and audio. So do that before you uh, give your question. While audience questions will frame our discussions later in the webinar, please do make your points at any time. And a couple of quick housekeeping points. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be loaded up onto the Food Bites YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And we won't have any slides or presentations. Today's session will be discussion led. Okay, let me turn to you, Jeanne. Um, the pandemic has uh, inevitably meant that single use plastics have skyrocketed uh, over the past few years, primarily due to health and safety concerns, of course. At the same time, as I said, consumers are increasingly demanding more sustainable options for branded products. So, Janan, what, what do you see as the main factors in play in the packaging sector right now? Yeah, I think you have a completely valid point. The pandemic really, you know, kind of reversed the trend of sustainability sustainable packaging a little bit, um, you know, for health and wellness, health and wellness reasons. Uh, but that's really temporary. I think uh, the pandemic really has accelerated um, 
the fact that packaging has become more uh, increasingly visible for, for us, for the consumers, for the brands, for the regulators, uh, for everybody. So, so from that perspective, uh, we are seeing an acceleration of the sustain, sustainable packaging development. Um, you know, consume, we're all consumers working from home, ordering more takeouts, uh, ordering things online. We, the, the, the whole packaging waste problem is becoming more and more tangible for us. We can you know, see how much we're throwing away in the end of the day. So from that perspective, um, it really helped consumers um, kind of be more ready to pay for more of the sustainable packaging and also you know, having a behavioral change. Um, not, not for everybody, of course, it's gonna take a lot of time, but from, from this perspective, um, it is making us consumers more ready for you know, what the industry is offering us, which is more sustainable packaging. Um, and this whole uh, sustainable packaging issue is also becoming you know, increasingly visible for brands uh, in the sense that it, it is more closely tied to brand image. It is a great tool for marketing. A lot of that obviously is, is pushed by consumers, um, but also by regulators. So well, today we're going to hear the, the great brands that's collaborating here to tell, tell, tell us about the story of their, their um, sustainable packaging. Um, and also I see that the regulation is really another, another major driving force. Many in the industry doesn't believe that there will be change without reg regulation. We all know uh, the European Union is kind of uh, very progressive on this whole issue of sustainable packaging, but really countries across the world, Canada, uh, Canada China, Australia, Argentina, um, India, right? Like in Southeast Asia, lots of, and lots of countries are uh, issuing more and more uh, regulations in the sustainable packaging front. Canada is moving forward with their um, national, nationwide uh, single-use plastic ban uh, that, that's deemed to happen towards the end of this year. Australia is well on, underway for the 2025 packaging reduction goal. Um, and for US, it is really hard for us to have a nationwide um, either packaging mandate or, or, or carbon tax, but a plastic tax is actually being proposed and discussed right now um, and uh, as, as part of an infrastructure bill, which would add as much as 20 cents per pound uh, for, for resin prices, which is huge. Obviously, a lot of you know opponents, a lot of companies or industry groups are, are, are signing on to fight this tax, but and it's so far from being settled, but it really does have implications across uh, the whole supply chain that uses U.S. plastic packaging. Uh, U.S. plastic and, and packaging is part of that. Um, so, so, you know, in terms of regulation, sometimes the, the packaging um, is single out, and a lot of times it's also part of a much bigger um, sustainability goal. For example, the EU's Fit, fit for 55 uh, decarbonization goal, right? So we, and that really pushes us to think about packaging not just as a, you know, piece of film or or a bottle. It really pushes us to think beyond the, the whole kind of life, life cycle, the overall impact of packaging from the raw material, how it's produced, uh, how it's processed, how it's transported, um, and, and the end of life. So that really calls out uh, multiple solutions to this whole issue, uh, it calls out for, you know, collaboration in this front as well. Great, thanks very much. Uh, what do you think the rule, the rule uh, of, um, uh, imposing uh, charges on consumers is here. I mean, we've had in many uh, legislations, we've had uh, additional charges on plastic bags that you get at the supermarket, for example. How effective are you, have you seen those compared to, uh, you know, taxes at so, you know, taxes on, on more raw materials? I would say both are equally as important. Um, I think um, the regulation really is pushing brands to kind of put down more tangible goals, um, right? It, they're either paying, um, they're either, I guess, paying for the tax that's that's going to come or the extended producer responsibility that's going to add on to their, to their cost, or, um, you know, they can invest a lot of that money to buying more expensive uh, recycled plastic, for example. Um, so that is definitely driving a lot of the innovation, but then another part is 
consumers, right? We cannot push any of that with consume with, without our consumers being um, def first of all wanted, but also second of all ready to pay for it. Um, in the end, it's not going to be just the consumers paying for everything, but they are certainly a crucial part of the situation. You know, if you see a bag of chips or or, or cookies two side by side, one with more sustainable packaging, one without, and either there's a 10, 20 cents difference, which would you buy? Um, are, is our cons uh, consumers ready for all of this? So really we require both force to kind of be driving to together um, towards a, a good goal. Sure, there's certainly loads, loads of interesting uh, questions and angles around how engaged with consumers or how consumers are engaging on, on packaging now. Thank you very much indeed. That's thank you. Um, we'll come back to many of those issues uh, a little later on, I'm sure. Just a reminder to those joining of you joining the call: two ways to interact with our panel tonight. There's a, or today, this morning, wherever you are, different time of the day. Uh, either put your comments into the uh, into the meeting chat, and I'll pick them up from there and put them to our panel. Or alternatively, you can raise your hand using the raise and hand function, which is uh, does that, um, and uh, you can then. Uh, we will then bring you into the conversation. We would love to have you ask your question live. So um, we will turn on your video and audio for you or enable you to do that. Uh, and you can ask your question to our panel. So please be thinking about your questions as we go and put them in the chat or raise your hand and I will bring you in as uh, appropriate time. Okay, let me turn to you, uh, Jordi now. Uh, welcome, uh, very early for you uh, in Australia. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, so great wrap makes a compostable cling wrap from upcycled food waste. So what was the inspiration for the product, Jody? Yeah, I mean, on one hand, I think there's everything that Shinan's has sort of been discussing around um, consumer behavior. I was a consumer um, and I was, I guess, pretty well pissed off. Um, it felt like I wasn't being offered what I wanted, uh, which ultimately feels like a great and exciting opportunity. But on the other hand as well, I think you look at um, energy, transport, agriculture, construction, these industries which just are rapidly changing. Um, the reality is 10 years from now, we're probably all gonna drive an electric um, car and, and, and you know, I think um, even aviation travel is probably gonna change quite significantly over the next um, 10 to 20 years, um, agriculture as well. And so I think for me, it felt like with packaging, um, there wasn't much really being offered. Um, and I guess, you know, now I get into it and I understand the complexity of everything. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they look at packaging, they're sort of looking for that silver bullet. They're looking for the electric vehicle solution. Um, so it's just one simple solution that's applicable to all forms of packaging. The reality is that's probably not the case. Um, there's going to be a variety of sort of solutions um, that are applicable to different um, sort of applications of packaging. So, you know, I guess when we started, it was as simple as um, here's a massive problem uh, and I want to solve that. And so Julia, my wife and I, um, I guess, began that journey about three years ago. Um, we landed on food waste as, as a source because I think for us, it, it seems um, like a great um, sort of feedstock. I mean, there's a lot of starch and glucose heavy waste um, out there readily available. Um, especially from the agriculture and pro food processing industries. Um, if food waste was a country, uh, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases outside of the US and China. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of statistics you read out there that are quite compelling. So um, we kind of landed uh, on that. And yeah, as I said, began that journey about three years ago. Okay, so how did you go about developing the, the wrap? Yeah, I think... Um, I guess fortunately I had a friend who um, is a chemical engineer at a food innovation lab here in Australia with Australia's largest university. Um, and so I sort of, uh, Julia and I went to him uh, quite early on, had the discussion, um, you know, here's a problem, what's a, what's a solution? And, and kind of began that journey there. Um, there was, at one point, there was a trial that was done in our kitchen with a, with a starch waste product and, and sort of it continues to sort of evolve. Um, now we have multiple factories and, and don't do trials in kitchens, thankfully. But um, I think it was really, I and Julia have been obsessed with material sciences. So Julia's spent the last 10 years of her life, life designing low carbon body buildings and looking at uh, materials um, to do that because she is an architect. So, um, and I was a winemaker. And I guess the process is that um, you go through and read dozens or if not hundreds of science publications um, and you find 
um, I don't know, little questions. And then it sort of becomes this paper trail of trying to solve a problem um, until you land on a product and, and then you trial that and it doesn't work. And then you do that about a thousand different times. And um, there's been many, many tears and many horrible iterations of our product to finally get something that actually resembles cling wrap. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, okay, so what uses is being put to now? Yeah, um, so currently we offer sort of essentially just a direct to consumer product. So um, in the US, you'd probably call it saran wrap. Um, in other parts of the world, you'd call it cling film. Um, but essentially um, we offer a product um, for consumers. Uh, we are launching in the US in May, which is super exciting. So we'll be over there. Um, but currently we just sell throughout Australia. Um, we are doing trials with our pallet wrap with a number of sort of household um, names. So wrapping pallets um, for freight um, and working with Australia's largest supermarkets um, to run trials on that as well. So hopefully the idea is um, within two years to completely eradicate petroleum based pallet wrap uh, in the Australian supply chain industry. Um, so we're well on the way um, to being able to do that. We're commissioning our, our second commercial factory, um, which will manufacture a total of 15,000 metric tons um, of pallet wrap made from local potato waste. Um, so uh, that'll get us to the point where we're about 40% of Australia's pallet wrap um, in manufacturing um, and definitely have sites set on Europe and North America um, to hit sort of similar targets. So um, are, is your product reusable in any shape or form or, or is it a single use? Uh, single use in a way, but um, if you were to throw it into into landfill, um, much like petroplastic, but um, it is compostable. So it's home compostable, which means it can compost at ambient temperatures uh, in compost pile at home. We understand that that's not the case for everyone. Um, food organics sort of recycling is um, quite common in Australia. We have 100, over 150 um, organic recycling facilities. Um, for a relatively small population. So it is something that a lot of local councils offer and, and it's quite simple and easy. Um, for other parts of the world, that gets more complex. Um, so we are looking at ways to actually recycle our product into second and third um, iterations of other products. Um, so essentially making our products not only um, compostable, but recyclable. So um, if it does fall out of that recycling loop, it can still break down in the ocean, in landfill, in a river, in a mountain, in a forest. So um, I guess that's what we do see as potentially a silver bullet. Yeah, so what, what happens if, say, I inadvertently put the product into uh, the wrong bin and it goes to landfill? What happens to your uh, wrap then? Yeah, so it still, it still breaks down um, into um, a carbon biomass and atmospheric CO2. So it takes about two years. Um, and through that process, um, we use an anaerobic biodegradable biopolymer. So um, essentially it doesn't release methane when it breaks down in landfill, um, as is the case with some other biopolymers, which has caused quite a stir. Sure. And I guess the big important thing to note is that um, the difference between biodegradable and compostable. Biodegradable just becomes worse and worse. It gets smaller and smaller bits of plastic potentially, whereas compostable becomes something else and is no longer a plastic. Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's, I mean, that's why people are very skeptical of new innovation in, in the packaging space, because some people came out with oxobiodegradable, which is exactly what you're referring to and, and other forms of biodegradable, which have um, created huge amounts of problems and, you know, large companies, companies trialed them and then, you know, were ultimately crucified um, for trying to solve a problem. And, and so people are worried about, you know, taking a step in the right direction because, or well, what about, you know, all the negative things that could change. So, um, you know, we, we ultimately want to solve that problem with creating a solution that, yeah, can break down in any environment. Great. Thank you. And thanks also to um, our audience. Another question coming in for Jordi. We'll come back to them. I will do my very best to make sure that Jordi does answer all the questions. Um, but we'll come back to them shortly. I do want to bring in uh, the, the other panellists. So um, let me turn to Roseanne now. Uh, thank you for your patience, Roseanne. So you're a food business at Grupo Bimbo. So as a food business, what are Grupo Bimbo's packaging needs? So we, we do have um, the need to, uh, obviously our, our packaging needs are to protect our, our food product to make sure that we maintain our quality, um, that it preserves the food um, for a set period of time, that we retain our nutrients and um, 
that we maintain the organoleptics or the taste of the food because who wants to um, buy a, a food that does not taste good? So that that's our main concern that we preserve the integrity of the food. Okay, um, so what then are the things that you require from packaging manufacturers to ensure that's the case, that, you, that you're able to do these things? So we, we look at the physical characteristics of the film. So we, you know, obviously test um, to make sure um, from a boring standpoint, like tensile elongation, that type of thing are correct. But we focus bread stales, for example, is the majority of our business. So we, we focus in on the, the WVTR characteristics and the um, not for bread, but our sweet baked goods um, for our little bites, for example, we're concerned about the oxygen transmission rate. Um, we um, look at the physical characteristics of it to make sure that they are maintained. Um, and um, obviously our customers are evolving in their decision making. So we are we um, we're lucky um, like we're at the 88 percent point um, in our overall packaging um, at BBU, which is Bimbo Bakery USA, um, and being recyclable. And um, we are cl clearly committed to being either, um, we say compostable, home compostable or recyclable by the 20, uh, 2025. We're very committed to that, as is our parent company, Grupo Bimbo. Um, we've taken a very uh, strong uh, line in the sand to, to meet that goal. And um, as a matter of fact, I'm missing a meeting right now to tell them how far along I am in those <laughs> goals. So, well, so thank you, everybody. <laughs> well, no, thank you. And, and I, I hope you're having more fun on the call here than you'd have in your meeting. It's certainly great to have, to have you with us. Um, so <laughs> I'm wondering then, um, how are you finding that your uh, requirements for packaging and, and the sort of packaging that you, you, you use, how are these, how is that evolving? And what are the, is the impact of, of consumers here? But we've talked about already how consumers have more and more a relationship with the packaging and their goods. So what are you hearing from your customers? What do they want to see wrapping their their bread and baked products? Well, they, they are. Um, we're we're um, having to answer more and more questions um, on a regular basis about um, are, 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 is our packaging recyclable and what are we doing to move toward, you know, compostable? They don't really understand that um, for example, our, our bread bags are highly recyclable. Um, over two years ago, we introduced a compostable um, bread bag. The, um, but it's um, what people don't realize is up to the consumer to take it that next step and take it to the recycling station because flexible films um, will jam the sorters at the, um, so, so they're not, typically they're not, um, you can't recycle them with your normal recycling um, items that you uh, uh, that your uh, garbage bin pick up. So you do have to take them to store drop off or to your local recycling center. And it's just a change in your habits. So we're trying to um, educate people that that's the correct way to do it. But they're highly recyclable and highly desirable to be um, recycled. So um, so that's what. Uh, we're trying to educate the uh, people toward and we're trying to get a feel for what they, they want. Um, because, uh, you know, we realize that the compostable films are more expensive, but we are um, we are committed to exploring everything possible and uh, we want to uh, because. Because it's the right thing to do and we're not the only com uh, company doing this. Um, we have forced uh, Western culture on people in third world countries like Indonesia, and we have introduced items um, we discussed it the other day, like peanut butter, and they can only afford like a little small um, pot of peanut butter that costs them. They can only buy 10 cents worth of peanut butter. And, you know, whereas they used to throw their banana out their hut door sure. and um, now they throw their peanut butter pod out their back door but it doesn't biodegrade like their their banana peel does. So, you know, what does it do? It ends up in the ocean and is polluting the waters. Well, we're we as a company, as a person, as a company are responsible for providing the solution. They might not buy our bread, but holistically we're responsible for providing a solution and therefore 
part of our solution is to work with companies like Great Rap Majority, for example, in in working to provide a worldwide solution. Sure. I guess you hit the nail on the head there in terms of the point is it has to be really easy for the consumer, wherever that consumer may be, whether it's mm -hmm. simply having a waste refuse system in place um, or having a a system a, a, a systematic recycling system in place. It must be easy for the consumer because you can have as many recyclable or compostable goods as you like, but if they're not then recycled or composted, then there's not a lot, not a lot of point. We're not getting any further forward. So that's the, the challenge is it making it um, easy for the consumer. Okay, uh, Roseanne, thanks very much indeed. Again, lots we can come back on. Janan, I wanted to bring you back in here um, and ask you to think about uh, how you're seeing the packaging sector developing and how much the future really needs to depend on the likes of uh, Roseanne and Jordi uh, collaborating on developing solutions. Well, I think that's, you know, 100% of um, the, the solution depends on that. And and just a little bit related to what Roxanne uh, said before, consumers not bring this recyclable or compostable packaging to the right place. Now, is it because they're not educated or is it, uh, you know, they, they're, they're confused about what to do or is it because of the, the lack of infrastructure? So the setting up of infrastructure nobody it's such a, a grand you know investment that no no company no government can do on its own so it really does require all of the companies the, the industry alliances and the government together to work on that but but if we're just looking at the packaging parts um you know all of that requires partnership whether it's you know partnerships between the in this case a startup and, and the corporate or a brand or it could be the the partnership between two startups, for example, a, a paper uh, dry pulping stuff startup uh, partnering with a, a plastic coating startup to, to develop, develop the right coating so that the paper bottle, um, you know, can we can use that for not just laundry detergent, but also for sparkling sparkling water, for example. But it also requires, um, you know, existing a uh, partnership between existing uh, large packaging companies and startups right to large packaging companies have the the manufacturing uh, capability uh, to help them scale up and startups have the technology and they need each other kind of to to help co-develop develop the solution and a lot of the times we, we need government um, involved as well in, in the startup process, whether it's in terms of grant or it could be in terms of, um, you know, uh, manufacturing facilities at a very low rate uh, for pilot testing, like exactly what one of the Food Bites alum did uh, with their compostable uh, food service, food service bowls, for example. So uh, partnerships across the, the industry is needed. That That's what we're seeing, but we need to see way more of that and, and there really needs to be a sense of urgency um if we want to solve this do you think there's a, an extent or a possibility of packaging becoming less um competitive becoming a, a non-competitive area to allow for a greater collaboration on solutions how practical is, is that do you think i so jordi used the uh, metaphor of electric vehicle and i actually think there is um you know they, they they're quite comparable in that sense you know, in the early, I guess, development stage of electric vehicle, uh, Tesla kind of left a lot of the technology open, non patented, so everybody can use this technology. So in, in the sense that, you know, they're not really competing within each other, they're kind of competing with the traditional uh, fuel cars. So from that perspective, I think there is um, a lot of possibility for packaging to become a non-competitive area, um, and also if we're looking at you know electric cars, um, there a lot of them are are increasingly sharing charging networks. So I think we are at the a stage where we need packaging to become non-competitive, um, uh, kind of between brands. Um, it's really a collaborative approach to to solve this to solve this issue. Sure, thank, thank you. So, so Jordi, are you going to make your technology open source for everybody? I, in a utopian world, Julia and I discuss this all the time, and I absolutely would love to do that. Um, I think, you know, like, yeah, I think you sort of touched on it briefly there, Shinon, like, we need 
that sort of cross collaboration but like again in a utopian world if there was some sort of plastic innovation lab um that focused on commercial outcomes and not perceived commercial value um so um you know in in startup world you you get as many patents as you can together and build as much hype as around your ip as possible so that you can go you know raise a, a crap load of money and and you know get in the front page of the wall street journal and and that's like that's a disgusting way to go about business what we need to be focused on is actual solutions and and collaboration like we collaborate if you look on the internet um probably with our biggest perceived competitive competitors but um, we have folks come to our factories and we go to theirs and we talk about ways in which we can work together to solve problems. And and I think that's the only way we're really going to get out of this mess. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, and Rosanne, I wonder if, if you want to comment on that as well. As a brand, um, obviously packaging is competitive. You obviously, you need, there's an area of competitive competition there. So how practical do you think or how far could we go in terms of making uh, packaging a non-competitive area? Um, I think that we, you know, introduce new packaging to get our customers excited, but then there, there is the point where we do share, you know, the knowledge with the, uh, for the greater good, you know, we, we do try to get the, the novelty out there just to, um, let people know what we're doing and, and get that, I guess that break even payback for, you know the studies to make sure people will buy it because we um to be honest bread doesn't have that high a margin so we, we pay for the marketing studies to make sure somebody will buy it <laughs> but but after that we we have had very serious discussions on it is the right thing to do to share it with the world and 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 we feel very strongly about that sure and, and that's definitely a trend isn't it because that in the past this would not have been something that had been happening. It would have been very much more um, retained on a proprietorial uh, basis. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Let me turn time now to some of our questions. I've not noticed anybody putting their hand up. Um, so I will uh, turn to uh, some of the questions um, that we have. Jordi, there was a couple of questions immediately uh, for you uh, when you were speaking. So, um, Jordy, Sarah Williams asks uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about the uh, composting infrastructure in Australia. So you mentioned that it's it's fairly extensive. So how extensive is it and how much does that enable you to, you know, to, for your product to be fully composted? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think um, so it's around 42 percent of Australian households compost, um, like have a compost bin. Um, so when we launched, um, it was something that people connected with um, quite strongly. Um, people really understood um, how to sort of go about that. I guess plastic uh, compostable packaging's reasonably evolved in Australia. Um, it is part of our packaging targets that all forms of plastic must be um, recyclable uh, or compostable by 2025. So um, I think it's sort of you know written written in law that and people are really um, gravitating towards that, which is great. Um, councils are also um, working towards this as well. So I'm not sure of the percentage, but I, I know it's the vast majority of um, councils now offer green organics recycling uh, facilities, so which you can put your compostable packaging into and, and then that can be further compostable, composted down the line as long as it's certified um, and it needs to display that logo. So, yeah, I, I'd say it's, it's fairly evolved. Again, it's... Um, it's a relatively inexpensive way. Um, like recycling technology is quite expensive if it if it works well. Um, so organic recycling is a really expensive way to dispose of um, compostable plastic. So I think councils and local governments really understand that um, and are sort of working towards this. As Australia, we essentially have a plastic export ban. Um, so uh, we used to send a lot of our plastic um, back to China and it was then recycled or, or put into landfill there because we just didn't have the, the infrastructure to recycle or, or landfills here. So uh, that's now not in place. So people are really rushing to figure out ways to get rid of their plastic. And they see, again, compostable packaging is a fairly ex inexpensive way to, to get rid of packaging. Sure. I'm hearing here a lot of uh, you know, use of good regulation. I mean, it requires governments to, to put their infrastructure in place. And I guess it requires that to be popular as well. I mean, people elect governments um, because of what they do. And if, clearly, in, in, perhaps in Australia, it seems that um, it's something that has, has been a popular move um, to, 
to, to do that, I guess, a composting by consent, I guess. Um, so, uh, Jordi, another question. How sustainable, um, our questioner asks, how sustainable is the manufacturing process for Great Wrap apart from using waste? Good question. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So currently our, our factory is solar powered. We're fully off the grid, um, don't rely on any, um, I guess, dirty energy um, or uh, non-renewable energy um, to power our factory. Um, we're at our second factory I mentioned earlier, we're setting up a biorefinery on site. Um, so um, our potato waste will travel about 30 minutes by a truck, um, will be 100% um, green energy powered by wind and solar. Um, and then we have a relatively, uh, we use a lot of green chemistry in the process of, in our sort of biorefinery. So in making biopolymers, you can actually use quite nasty solvents um, that are pretty harmful for the environment. So we've sort of designed this out in the process. Um, I think we're sort of quite driven by creating the most environmental um, sound and sustainable product. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, there are biopolymers out there that are made from palm oil or um, from cornstarch that requires huge amounts of land and fertilizer um, that can be um, um, quite damaging to the environment. So again, it, it's sort of tough. There's no sort of silver bullet. It's um, on one end of the spectrum, it can be extremely damaging, damaging and on the other end, it can, um, you know, be quite good. We, we started at the bad end of the spectrum in, in terms of bioplastics, um, um, quite honestly, but, you know, you'd have to go on that journey. Um, our company's slogan is the best materials possible every day. Um, so we're trying to do as best we can and continue to iterate and make it more sustainable. Do you know the carbon footprint of your product versus a conventional plastic made with entirely renewable energy? Uh, no, we, we've, we've compared a lot of different sort of LCAs or life cycle analysis um, of our products versus others. Um, yeah, we haven't done edit against a carbon footprint of a a petroleum-based plastic made with renewable sources. Um, I think a lot of the plastic manufacturers that we speak to in Australia, again, like companies we visit, um, don't have much of an interest in where their energy comes from. And sadly, Australia still relies quite heavily on coal industry. Um, so, yeah, I think once we get to a full complete stage of our biorefinery um, operating, then we'll start to switch to, okay, let's compare this against a variety of different scenarios and then offering that data to our customers, but also allowing enterprises to track their carbon footprint um, by using our product um, to see a decarbonisation versus um, traditional petroleum plastic. Sure, thanks. One more question, and Rosanna, I will bring you in in a sec, because I think this question is uh, really highly relevant for you as well. So how does your product perform then in different circumstances? Our uh, questioner asks about in refrigeration and, and, and you know frozen shipments, I guess on the shelf as well, because if you're uh, Roseanne and you're buying uh, you know, your packaging for, for bread products, you need to know how long it's going to, to stay on the shelf and, and not deteriorate. Yeah, no, it's a great, a great question. I think a lot of people ask it, yeah, all the time. Um, so essentially our product breaks down when it's exposed to sunlight, moisture and bacteria. Um, if it's exposed to just sunlight and moisture, it will start to degrade slowly. Um, but bacteria is something, um, so essentially while it, when it's in a compost bin uh, is why it breaks down so fast because of all the microbial um, action um, happening around it. So essentially, if you were to leave it on the shelf uh, or, you know, if it was wrapping some bread in your, in your pantry, um, it would last a couple of years. Uh, we have a really high mm -hmm. oxygen barrier rate um, uh, in our packaging um, because we are making a cling film for the food industry. Um, so we're highly aware of um, how important that is as well. What about in a refrigerator or in a freezer? Yeah, totally fine. I actually um, store our cling wrap in a freezer because it um, essentially it just rolls off much easier when you store it in a freezer. Um, so yeah. yeah it, it, is it a similar shelf life? Is it, is it two years in the freezer to the sort of life of it? Same sort of yeah, yeah, life. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah. So Roseanne, is that, that, I guess that's really important for you. You need to know that the product has that performance. Yes, um, and and we've we found that to um, with our uh, compostable bag, we found that to be true. Um, one of the bigger challenges is, um, uh, you know, how um, does it have all the pr proper um, uh, 
transmission rates and everything that Jordy just alluded to, like the oxygen transmission rate. So um, we have no fear that it's going to, to break down on the on the store shelf or anything like that. So, you know, it has to it has to have um, the the microorganisms from the soil uh, and um, and pick up hydration from the soil to pr to break down. So it's it's not going to break down on the store shelf. There's no and fear I, of that. Sure. And I guess that is the challenge for you when you're looking at alternative products. Um, I mean, people forget sometimes that people we use plastic because it was so, so good at its job. But I guess for different types of products, you can then have perhaps a a a, a wrapping material, a, a packaging material that has different properties. I mean, a loaf of bread will itself only be on the shelf for a matter of a, a week or two, perhaps. Um, so you you don't then need a, a something that would last for many years. So do you take that in, into consideration if you're able to get, go you know, further into a, a more interesting packaging that as long as it lasts significantly longer than the product, that's all you need, right? Yes. Well, if you if you think about it, you, you do need your packaging to last um a, a decent amount of time because not only do you need to extrude it you need to ship it and it has to um some some brands don't um fly off the shelves um as much as others so you want to be responsible and um when you print and convert them that you you want to go into longer runs to be more efficient so so you are are correct but but not so much as sitting on the shelves as when you're making the bags. Sure. So 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 it's it's more on the back end that you have to be more efficient than the front end. <laughs> sure. No, absolutely. So thank you. Okay. Uh, next question. And this is a this is a it's a it's a conference title. It's sort of a, a question. Um, it's a uh, compostable versus recyclable. What is ultimately more sustainable in practice? Uh, wow, that's a biggie. Um, Janan, don't ever go at that. Just see if you can answer that one. Which is more sustainable, compostable versus recyclable? That is a huge debate within the industry, and I don't know if there is a right answer. And personally or professionally, I yeah, I, I don't know if there which one is more sustainable in practice. Um, I think it really depends on the situation. There are some that argues, you know, compostable that works better, but there are some there are people that's in the plastic industry that's completely against compostable just because if it mingles into the recyclable stream then it kind of um it becomes pollution as well so really there is no right answer and i i think this is a case with a lot of a lot of the you know issues in the plastic packaging industry you know whether to use mechanical recycling or chemical recycling that is able to bring the you know create the the recycled pure recycled content for packaging but consuming a, a huge ton of energy but is able to kind of um you know recycle the really difficult to recycle products so it is a really difficult question i don't know if there's one but like what jordy said whatever you know um Kind of the application is suitable for it depends on also depends on your location if you're close to a potato starch you know waste facility right the transportation distance it, it really is a case-by-case -case study um yeah <laughs> yes uh yeah it, it is it's obviously a very difficult question to answer um particularly in in in, in a short space of time but i mean perhaps sorry i mean does it boil down to it depends on the product. I mean, if you've got PET, for example, PET bottles, they can be recycled and reused, I think it's eight times, um, and you know, and, and make essentially the same qualities as, as, a, as virgin material. So perhaps that's an example where recycling, closed recycling is really good and it, it can work very well. But your product, you've been developed a product to counter where, well, nobody was recycling the sort of the, the cling film type wraps. So you developed a product which solves the avoids those wraps going into the environment. So this it just really depends on the product, doesn't it? Jordy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like polyethylene, which most pallet wrap or pretty much all pallet wrap is made from, um, is pretty much near impossible um, to recycle. Um, so the vast majority of all of the world's pallet wrap just goes to landfill. Um, sadly, in Australia, we we import um, the you know petroleum, refine it, and then use it once to freight something maybe ten kilometers or hundred kilometers down the road, and then um, it, it goes to the landfill, and that, that's you know it's super sad as a, as a scenario. Um, I do think though, like even recycled products, I mean, you 
refer to PET, um, but like we've all seen hundreds of water bottles in the ocean in our life. So it, it's sort of the ultimately like humans aren't perfect. Um, uh, we, we make mistakes. And I, I remember, you know, walking kilometers just to find a, a bin that could find, you know, recycle an aluminium can once. And, but then, you know, as you get older, you kind of go, oh, there's a bin over there or maybe I'll just pop it in and no one will see it. And so it's just like how we are as people. And, and so, yeah, I think we need to offer solutions that, um, uh, as simple as possible. Um, and again, that sort of creates a lot of complexity. So, um, but we, we did sort to replace anything that couldn't be recycled is that's high on our kind of hit list of, um, a product roadmap. Sure. Roseanne, do you want to comment on that briefly? Just look at the, the challenges there. Well, yes, I, I, I got to thinking about it and you know how we paper actually has a very high recyclable rate and we all know that. And in the United States, we're all gearing our packages to go toward a polyethylene type recyclable structure. And so if we got it down to two being a compostable and a recyclable polyethylene structure and made those very well designated, then I, I see that it would be very simple to put them in a polyethylene stream and a compostable, being a home compostable stream and being able to um, attain a high level of either and um, living in both those worlds because we certainly have been able to recycle aluminum cans very well and um, being able to um, recycle paper very well. So I, I think, you know, that that's uh, that's a doable solution and um certainly somebody could do that in their home with ease sure okay thanks uh, thanks very much indeed next question we have is looking at uh, the use of post-consumer waste uh recycled materials in food packaging um our questioner asks um has anyone uh, used post-recycled waste recycled, uh, recycled material in their food packaging um either paper or plastic um specifically for freezer or fridge safe safe materials. I guess, Jordy, that's what your product does. Just put myself off mute. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, in a way, yeah, it's, it, it definitely does. Um, you know, the, the potato waste we use comes from chip manufacturers. So it essentially is a, uh, a food waste um, from, you know, um, a consumer product. Um, and so, yeah, we, we definitely, um, are really proud of that um and you know we are, we are even looking at because we, we still can't use all of that potato waste we can use the majority but there's still a waste from the waste uh and so we're trying to figure out solutions of of what we can do with that um so that doesn't end up in a paddock or you know just as cattle feed so yeah definitely that's that's been a, a huge focus for us um and also you know we're always on the lookout for other um so alternatives um, from post-consumer waste and, and from agricultural waste. Um, what are other solutions out there? And, and you know, we're not going to solve all of the world's plastic waste problem with potato waste. Um, it's stupidity, to, you know, to think like that. So we have to look at, okay, well, you know, if we want to continue to expand and our company vision is to completely replace petroleum-based plastic, how are we going to do that? You know, uh, is it atmospheric CO2 or is it, um, other forms of agricultural and processing waste or post-consumer waste. If, if it helps, I'm prepared to eat more chips, if that would help. Yeah. Um, <laughs> me. Um, uh, Roseanne, can I ask the same thing to you, though? Uh, just how much how much are you seeing post the use of post-consumer waste and recycled material into food packaging, yeah, like, like, like Jordy is, as Jordy is doing? Um, I guess I feel comfortable saying that we're exploring all opportunities. There is not enough um, post-consumer um waste as far as um I, i'm not gonna um you're asking for food or for plastics let me make sure i'm understanding the it's, correct it's just really the, the, in terms of trends what are you seeing in terms of post-consumer waste being brought in to be used it used for for for, for food packaging for food packaging we, we 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 see it we're we're looking um obviously we look at everything um there's not enough post consumer waste to um for everybody to be able to use it so um but we we're certainly exploring um every everything that's out there but um everybody that's volunteering to use it there's not enough to go around is a good way to put it <laughs> sure absolutely 
Okay, um, thank you again for your questions, everybody. Um, I'm, I haven't seen anybody putting their hand up at this stage. Coming towards the end, um, a question each for uh, Roseanne and for, um, for Jordi. Question for you, Roseanne. Um, our questioner suggests that given the buying power that Grupo Vimbo represents globally, what sort of impact do you think you can have on, on shifting uh, demand for sustainably produced compostable materials? And I guess also the influence you can have on, on regulators. I mean, we've talked already about how sympathetic regulation can be very helpful here. So what do you what, what do you do as Grupo Vimbo to, to shift demand for sustainably produced packaging and also to move the needle on regulation? Um to to as far as to um look at uh compostable packaging we're we're exploring everything there's not enough compostable packaging out there um to meet the um to meet our demands um i'll, I'll say that first and foremost so uh there's no way we could shift it over um BBU by itself by, uh, produces three trillion loaves of bread. So, um, you know, we, we would have to be very judicious about what if we were to move some over other than what we have, we'd, we'd have to be selective. It's a very tight market right now. Um, so uh, as far as as regulation, we are we, we study it very carefully and we are participating in the groups. Um, uh, no, nobody has the answer. All, all we're doing is, is participating right now. We know that there is a need and we are studying what the appropriate course of action should be. Um, but sure. but we are like everybody else. We, we just know that there is a need and are trying to figure out what the appropriate action is to take. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Indeed. Well, uh, we have had some raise their, someone raise their hand. Michael Spencer, you win the moderator's prize for the uh, session. Michael, uh, perhaps can, could Michael be allowed to unmute himself? And Michael, then you can ask your question. Sure, thank you. Oh, <laughs> Mike, I think you, ben remuted, you, you may have remuted yourself, Michael. Here we are. You're all right. <clears throat> Thanks for that. No, it's just interesting to see you. Obviously, great reps you know, started out with a couple of key products there and moving you know, across the industry now. but. We're an Australian-based business as well, and, and really interested to see where they're taking the next evolution of products. The clear film space, you know, that for packaging in, in fruits and vegetables and the like. Um, you know, obviously there's a sugar cane style plastic having issues with the hazing and the like, but really interested to understand if Great Wrap are looking to do something in that space. That's great. And Michael, perhaps you could just let us know who you're with. Yeah, we're with Stack Farm, Automated Indoor Farming Group. Great. Thanks very much, Steve, for the question. Jordy. Yeah, we're, we're definitely exploring it. Um, and we've kind of created a five year product roadmap um, and food packaging is is pretty high on that and, and clear films, um, just because it's it's probably the biggest problem we have in packaging, uh, ultimately in trying to get that recycled. So uh, that's where we're looking. Um, keeping it clear is probably our biggest challenge. Um, so depending on our sort of process and system it can vary from almost brown in color to kind of slightly opaque um and so when it comes to um food packaging um if you buy a loaf of bread and it's got a brown bag you'd be you know a bit nervous so um we have to figure out ways in which we can purify and design things out um but then it changed the cost so then you know that it's what we're definitely highly active in in trying to solve this problem and create clear films that are suitable for a wide variety of, of packaging. So using blown film lines and other film lines. So um, I think in the future, we'd probably see ourselves more working towards being a biopolymer sort of raw materials provider and then working with other manufacturers in the space. So that's probably the biggest way in which we can scale quickly because we now know setting up a manufacturing facility takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So um, you would, we'd rather work with other manufacturers in the packaging space in providing them with the raw materials and walking them through on how to process it. Great. Um, thanks very much indeed. I do have one more question I want to put from um, from the audience before we come to our final question that I've got for everybody. And it's a good one. Um, question really about uh, cost versus um, the solution itself. And I'd like to ask this to all the panel to answer briefly, but I'll start with you, Roseanne. Um, 
if you're in a meeting and you say we've got this fantastic solution, it's very it, it, it solves so many of our environmental and sustainable uh, goals, but it costs 25 percent more, say. What sort of reaction do you get? How does that conversation go for you? Because I can't imagine it's, it would be an easy one. <laughs> to be honest, we still look at it. Um, that that we are willing to uh, look at it and and see how viable it is. Does it have the correct um, parameters that we need for our product? And uh, um, you wouldn't believe what we've looked at to see if if it. We will t we will actually test it. Um, we've tested things that um, are much more expensive than that to see if if it's viable because we are that committed to env the environment, and uh, we'll take it from there. If it if it proves out, um, then s so be it. And and as, as that process gone down, have you actually managed to then bring in? products which perhaps might be initially more expensive but then because they hit the other goals and the other targets you could, you're able to bring them in yes <laughs> i'll be great. honest we have <laughs> great to hear okay jordy for you how much when you're when you're um when you're marketing your product how important is uh price for you how do you have to be up there competitive on price or do you get a bit of leeway given you've got you know you're ticking lots of other boxes yeah, look, I think from that direct to consumer angle, people are willing to pay significantly more. Um, and thankfully, when we were starting out, um, our product cost significantly more. Um, so that was fine. Um, when you start dealing with you know major supermarkets or, or big um, international brands, um, it gets more challenging, and you do have to be competitive. Um, but we also have a pathway to pretty much parity um, with petrochemical um plastic um that will get there uh over the next 18 months and you know we bring those big customers on that journey and tell them you know if you want to be first in line then then come with us now and and let's hold hands and walk down this merry path so yeah it, it's super important and you, you don't have to just perform as well you you definitely have to be priced just as well if you want to hit that sort of scale where you're not on you're not offering a product that has that sort of green premium but actually you're offering a product that can try and solve a problem so it's it's fr totally front of mind for us sure okay um i want to ask everyone one final question uh, it's really to think about what's coming up next so what are the next generation uh, packaging solutions going to look like and the exciting potential products that they're seeing on the horizon um roseanne do you want to answer that and quickly if you wouldn't mind we're getting quite close to the end of our time um, what are you excited about i'm i'm excited about both um I think I'm more excited about the compostable bags. I mean, you know, like I said, we're we're at 87 percent recyclable, but the next generation complicated recyclable, um, replacing complicated laminations, if if that be it for recyclable, and then compostable where we are already recyclable. Thanks, Roseanne. Um, Jordy, question to you. Same one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah atmospheric co2 there's a number of folks in um already working on this and are pretty active in the space i'd say within the next 15 years we're going to see it be extremely commercially viable um and a lot of our plastic will be made i, I assume from atmospheric co2 gosh that is exciting um Jinan, for you then what are you excited about what do you think is the going to be the next big developments in 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 packaging I'm excited about a lot of the uh, kind of the fiber based uh, alternatives for plastic packaging. Uh, it, it's a huge challenge for fiber based products right now that they, they aren't performing as well as um, the plastic counterparts. Um, but with the you know, advancement of coatings or, or different linings, compostable linings, um, you know, repulpable linings, um, that would that could be possible and, and a lot of development on that end. OK. Well, look, um, it's been a fascinating conversation. It's one of these debates that could go on all day. There's, a, a, as I said, a conference's worth of, of discussions to be had. But um, my thanks to Janan, to Roseanne and Jordi for their insight over the past hour or so. And big thanks also to the Food Bites team at Rabobank for setting up the webinar and for asking me to moderate. I've really enjoyed it. As I did mention earlier, uh, the webinar will shortly be available on demand via the Food Bites YouTube channel. 
and you'll get a link from the Food Spike team shortly to that. But for now, my thanks again to the panel. Thank you for all your questions and thank you for your company. And goodbye. Thank you, Ian. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.